It's been a long time coming, but we finally arrived at the last well-known floor guardian within Nazarick. The ruler of the Frozen Glacier and guardian of the fifth floor, Kokaitis. Well, Kokaitis if you watch the dub, and Kokutis if you watch the sub. Regardless, we're here to learn about Nazarick's second best bug and highly capable master of weapons. So let's take a look at everything from his lore and creation to all the external elements that influence his character and hopefully we'll answer the video's title question of who is Kokaitis. Just like we did with all the other Floor Guardians, we can learn a lot about Kokaitis by first looking into the one that created him. In this case, it was the Ainz Ul Gon guild member, Warrior Takemakazuchi. So we'll start with him and gain a bit of insight into what he might have been thinking when he was creating the tomb's fifth Floor Guardian. Warrior Takemakazuchi, or technically Bujin Takemakazuchi, with Bujin meaning warrior, was one of the founding members of the guild. He played as a Nephilim samurai with a glass cannon build that had relatively low defense but extremely high offense. And he really was a warrior at heart. He loved to test his skills in a challenging fight against a difficult boss. Things like jumping into dungeons, fighting headfirst with no preparation, or facing down impossible odds really got him going. And he would either overcome them with sheer skill or end up going out in a blaze of glory. So basically, he seemed like the type of guy who'd enjoy playing Dark Souls. But aside from engaging in earnest combat, one of his biggest passions in Yggdrasil was collecting and crafting different weapons. Of course, this also doubled as a way to improve his build since he was always min-maxing it as best he could in order to one day defeat his rival Touch Me in a 1v1. Speaking of which, from head to toe and beginning to end, his build was completely themed around a samurai. For instance, his name is a reference to a Shinto god of thunder and swords, one that's most well known for leading a military campaign against the terrestrial deities who inhabited Earth. And this was all at the orders of one of the chief deities of heaven, Amaterasu. Even his equipment was Japanese themed as well. I mean, his main weapon was a katana, and the armor he wore was a heavily stylized fantasy version of the typical Japanese samurai armor. As for his combat build, it was designed to strike his opponents with incredibly powerful blows. To put into perspective just how powerful this man was, it was said that among all the melee combat specialists of Nazarick, only Nishiki on Rai's sneak attack focused build could deal more damage in a single hit. This might have been his attempt to imitate the famous Japanese sword fighting style called Iaido, which emphasized killing one's opponent in a single strike with a single motion. This also included drawing and sheathing the sword at lightning speeds, which is something that you've probably seen numerous times before in various anime. But what you see there is typically a more stylized version of what you can expect from real life. The real Iaido is more like an art, emphasizing grace, penitence, and smooth technique. Anyway, aside from his high damage strikes, he also had multiple skills that summoned spiritual warriors modeled after the Buddhist deities known as the Five Wisdom Kings. Since Buddhism plays a prominent role alongside Shintoism in the world of Japanese spiritualism, this further built on Takemikazuchi's overarching Japanese theme. He pretty much tried his best to grab everything that was Japanese in the game and put it onto or into his character. Though probably the most important thing to know about him was that he was the kind of guy to name his sword Takemikazuchi Mark I, then name the upgraded version the Mark II, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the current Mark VIII. Put simply, I don't think he was a particularly creative person. Sure, he was obsessed with collecting and creating weapons, but if you can't really muster up enough creativity to find a cool name for your own personal passion projects, then you're likely not very creative in general. So if we use that as a groundwork for a lot of his decisions regarding Kokaitis' creation, then Kokaitis' design starts to make a lot of sense. And what I mean by that is that I don't think he put a whole lot of thought into Kokaitis' lore or backstory. In many ways, Kokaitis is kind of a clone of Takemikazuchi's character. High attack power, mediocre defense, high damage attack skills, and so on. Similarly, rather than go for something wildly different or unorthodox for his personality, he went with something very familiar. Much like his contemporary and rival Touch Me who created Sebastien, his creation doesn't have a particularly complex or creative personality. Still, like most of the guild members, he based it on a trope that he found enjoyable, but that's pretty much as deep as he went with it. After that, he didn't really flesh him out much further. So, just like how it was with Sebas and his combat butler trope, since Takemikazuchi romanticized the samurai so much, he decided to design Kokaitis around that theme. Ultimately though, what makes Kokaitis interesting as a character is very similar to that of what makes Sebas an interesting character. 
in the sense that it's not necessarily his design, which isn't particularly complex or nuanced, but rather how his character develops in subtle ways over the course of the narrative. You see, in response to the events that occur throughout the anime or the light novel, we see Kokaitis slowly develop into much more than what Takemikazuchi ever intended for him. But before we get into that, we'll first break down everything there is to know about Kokaitis' character, starting of course with his name. Kokaitis is a reference to one of the layers of hell in Dante Alighieri's epic poem called The Divine Comedy, the first part of which is named Inferno, resulting in the poem being often colloquially referred to as Dante's Inferno. In the poem, hell is divided up into layers of concentric circles, with each successive layer growing smaller and deeper, and each being home to those guilty of different sins. Just before the very bottom, the center of hell, we have the ninth layer, the frozen lake known as Kokaitis. The lake itself is said to be frozen solid, with traitors, oathbreakers, or any person who has betrayed someone that they had close ties with being entombed in this ice. For as Dante writes, the treacheries of these souls were denials of love and of all human warmth. Only the remorseless dead center of the ice will serve to express their natures. Incidentally, because of its connection with extreme cold, the word Kokaitis is occasionally used in Japanese video games for powerful ice magic, and given that Kokaitis' floor is known for its cold environment, it's a pretty notable connection. Honestly, the name he gave to Kokaitis is actually quite fitting, making you wonder if he really did come up with it himself. Especially considering that he seems like the type of guy to name his creation something like NPC number one. Now, you might think of it as an interesting bit of irony to name Kokaitis after a place where traitors are punished, but once you know more about his personality, it does make a good amount of sense. So let's explain. Kokaitis' specific personality is probably a reference to one of the samurai tropes common in Japanese fiction, which we'll dive into in just a second. The samurai, originally meaning roughly the same as knight, but later taking on the meaning of soldier, are often said to have followed a code called Bushido, translating literally to Way of the Warrior. And most samurai character tropes tend to portray characters who embody different interpretations of the code. In a sense, you could loosely compare it to Western knights and their code of chivalry, though there are some major differences. First of all, the code is unwritten and unspoken. It isn't explained, so you just have to learn to understand it intuitively by studying and copying other samurai. It was largely influenced by Buddhist and Shinto religions, the code, generally speaking, emphasizes absolute loyalty to one's lord, a frugal life, and mastery of the martial arts. For those of you who know anything about Eastern spiritualism, you'll recognize a lot of dualism in Bushido. Dualism is, to put simply, the notion that everything can be divided into two opposing sides, and the ideal way to live is typically to remain in balance with both sides. This is the idea behind yin and yang. In Bushido specifically, the point was for the samurai to balance out their capacity for great violence and aggression with an equal capacity for peace, contemplation, serenity, and wisdom. The most popular formulization of Bushido came from a book titled Bushido, The Soul of Japan. Written in 1900, the author Nitobe Inazo specified that Bushido could be summarized by eight major virtues. Righteousness, courage, compassion, respect, honesty, honor, loyalty, and self-control. True warriors live life to its fullest and possess a courage that is confident, intelligent, and strong. True warriors don't need to prove their strength and have no need to be cruel. True warriors don't have to promise anything. When they say they will do something, it will be done. Essentially, warriors train to become strong, and then they use that strength to help others. That's what this code is, and you can tell throughout the anime that Kokaitis attempts to embody many of these virtues. As a quick aside, one interesting facet of Bushido was that this code was actually developed in the Edo period in Japanese history, and it's believed by some historians to be the means to restore the lost honor of samurai following the fierce and brutal Sengoku period. In case you're not familiar, the Sengoku period was most notable for its near-continuous civil war between various military generals. Each was attempting to seize power from the other and control the rest of Japan, and it became this age of warring states that lasted for nearly 150 years. Lots of historical anime is set either during this era or immediately following it, and although we see depictions of the honorable samurai clashing with the lawless thugs and bandits, the line between the two was often blurred. For instance, there was a practice known as sujigiri, where a samurai would test the effectiveness of a new weapon on some random helpless passerby or peasant. 
It wasn't widespread by any means, but it did happen. And due to the constant military conflict, starvation was rampant among the civilian populace, and new samurai were often pressed into service through violence, intimidation, or bribery with food by the local armies. Now, in contrast, the Edo period was one of relative peace and prosperity. The new shogunate had consolidated power, outlawed various activities, and reunited Japan. It was here that Bushido was developed, assumed to bring back those samurai ideals that once existed even before the Sengoku period. Though little evidence exists to suggest that some form of Bushido actually existed back then. So perhaps Bushido was a simplification and unification of a diverse variety of widespread beliefs and ideals. In any case, despite Bushido being invented after the Sengoku period, Japanese fiction often tends to portray it as having existed during the Age of Warring States. This ultimately led to the formation of various tropes and character archetypes in fictional dramas set in the Sengoku period. Now, I'm not saying that there are a bunch of rigid, clearly defined tropes that everyone uses, but those of you who have watched or read any anime or manga that's set in the Sengoku period will probably understand what I'm trying to get at here. But if you are confused as to why I'm telling you all this, well, naturally, someone like warrior Takemakazuchi would have adopted one of these samurai tropes for the NPC that he created. Whether it be the silent ronin anti-hero who wanders the land and protects the innocent, or even the hot-headed kid who's always looking to prove himself in battle, there must have been a stereotypical samurai theme that Takemikazuchi wanted for Kokaitis. So, although it wasn't specifically identified as such, we like to use the nickname Uncle Samurai to refer to the character trope that Kokaitis was given. The Uncle Samurai is usually a close friend and fiercely loyal retainer of the Lord or General type character. It's often found that in these kinds of stories, the lord or general due to any number of reasons has or will die early on in the plot, and it's their son that typically ends up being the protagonist. The Uncle Samurai, despite being unrelated by blood to the lord character, has formed such a strong bond with the lord that he is trusted to help watch over and raise the son. Usually, the Uncle Samurai would teach the kid how to fight, and even raise the child as if it was his own. Now, this may not seem very fitting to Kokaitis' character, but in Season 1, Episode 2, there is a conversation between Demiurge and Kokaitis where Kokaitis fantasizes about being this very type of uncle to Ainz's kin. So, this trope does relate, and it's in these types of stories that the Uncle Samurai would have a contrasting personality to the brash and aggressive son, usually embodying the proper Bushido code, with his great loyalty to his former lord often being demonstrated when they help protect the son from various incidents that the son will inevitably find himself in. Even so, given all of that, the Uncle Samurai isn't perfect. They usually aren't any kind of tactical or strategic genius. As a matter of fact, they are usually both less intelligent and less skilled at fighting than the lord that they serve. Still, they were trusted by their lord to be a lieutenant and lead a detachment of troops into battle, not for their leadership or tactics, but rather because they had the loyalty of their men, which in turn brings respect and loyalty to the lord, much of which is born out of respect for that superior wisdom and skill that their lord possesses. So, at this point, you've probably been able to pinpoint many parallels of the Uncle Samurai character trope with Kokaitis, especially when you look at some of his more notable scenes from the anime, most of which are exemplified by the personality that he was given, rather than the backstory he should have. Speaking of which, we don't know much of Kokaitis' backstory, and knowing Takemikazuchi, he might not have really wrote much of it at all. However, we do know that much like his creator, Kokaitis loves collecting weapons, whether this was Takemikazuchi just lacking creativity and mimicking himself in Kokaitis, or whether this is another example of NPCs inheriting personality quirks from their creator, it's difficult to know. Ultimately though, a lot of the traits of the Uncle Samurai character, as well as Bushido in general, do describe Kokaitis pretty well. The most obvious example being his fierce loyalty to Ainz. Then, he is also not very tactical or strategic, seems to only battle for the sake of battling, as well as is generally fairly serene when in battle, but also friendly outside of it. More specifically, there are many scenes where we can see this honorable Uncle Samurai personality in action. Like when other NPCs are arguing, he often chastises them for behaving shamefully in front of eyes. He is also very honest and friendly to all NPCs, summons, mercenary vassals, and so on, and even attempts to build a friendly camaraderie with all the other warriors in Nazareth. Conversely, he finds deceit, underhandedness, and guile distasteful. We see this often in the comedic side stories released as bonus material for those who purchase the Blu-rays in Japan. 
For example, there's one scene where Eines asks the Guardians to try putting on the famous Shakespearean play Romeo and Juliet. And of course, Albedo and Shaltir naturally pressure him into playing the role of Romeo, so that the two of them can play Juliet. Shaltir attempts to get Kokaitis to vote for her to be Juliet by telling him that she'd get him the role of Tybalt so that he could spar with Eines. But despite being such an extremely tempting offer, he ultimately resisted the bribe and remained neutral. And it really was an extremely tempting offer. Sparring with Eines is actually one of Kokaitis' primary interests. I mean, in one of the other side stories, Eines was trying to come up with the rewards that he can give to the Guardians for all of their hard work. When he asked Kokaitis what he wanted, naturally, one of the rewards he requested was an opportunity to spar with Eines. Incidentally, he also asked Eines to make an heir. But unfortunately for us, Eines rejected both requests. Then, just like how the Lord trusts the Uncle Samurai to lead troops into battle, the whole Lizardman arc pretty much embodied that aspect of the trope. Kokaitis was entrusted by Eines to annihilate the Lizardmen with the undead army that he was given. Unfortunately, the Lizardmen withstood the attack, leaving Kokaitis ashamed for bringing defeat to Nazarick's name. But he didn't despise them for it. Instead, he was impressed by the Lizardmen's ability to win even when faced with overwhelming odds. So when he went back to Nazarick, he asked Eines if he could subjugate them instead of wipe them out. Eines agreed. But to redeem himself of this failure and remove this stain from Nazarick itself, Kokaitis had to achieve victory over the Lizardmen by himself, a task very fitting for a samurai that was looking for redemption. Of course, just like we saw, the Lizardmen stood no chance, but lucky for them, they had already proved themselves in Kokaitis' eyes, which resulted in their later resurrection after being defeated. Now, that was the short version of that story. There's actually a whole lot more elements to that arc that I want to talk about, but we'll get into how this whole Lizardman arc developed Kokaitis as a character in the next video. And you'll be able to see what I mean when I said that it seemed that Kokaitis' personality was developing into something more throughout the narrative's progression. But for now, this is the basis of Kokaitis as a character. Everything that could or did go into his creation, we thoroughly analyzed. Of course, I know some of you will complain that I went into too many tangents, what with the Bushido stuff and the Uncle Samurai trope, but that's what the Who Is video series is all about. Next time though, you can be sure that we'll talk a lot more about Kokaitis himself. Now, before I go, don't forget that I did start two new cut content series that you can check out on my channel. It does really help out a lot when you watch my other videos. So, if you like other fantasy anime like Danmachi or Arifuretta, then I think you might like these videos as well. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!